All right, so today I'm going to be talking about another one of the major plant families. Uh, this time I'm going to be talking about the family Fabaceae, otherwise known as Leguminosae. Uh, Leguminosae means that they're legumes, and Fabaceae means that there are plants like Faba. Faba was its own genus, but now Vicia Faba is... Uh, uh, it's, in, it's in a different genus now, but uh, plants that are similar to broad beans. Broad beans are sort of the type species and the uh, family is defined by its similarities to that particular species. All families are defined by their similarity to a particular species. So, and the, uh, the genus is things that are closely related to the species and the family is a large group of well, not necessarily a large group, but a larger group of uh, related genera. And uh, there could be only one genus in a family, but in the case of this family, there are thousands. Uh, and uh, I think it's estimated that uh, members of the bean family make up somewhere around five to 10% of the flowering plant species in the world. So it's a really huge plant family. A lot of them grow in tropical areas. Uh, a lot of tropical woods are members of the bean family. And uh, in addition to, well, there are all sorts of different plant types, uh, growth habits, as we might call them, in this family. So there are uh, trees like redbud trees and locust trees that would grow around here are members of the bean family. Um, there are also bushes, uh, there are, um, vines. I think on, on one of our plant walks, we saw the, uh, stick tights, the little triangular Velcro-like seeds that, that stick to you. They're a member of the bean family. Um, I mentioned at the time that the seeds inside of the pods taste a lot like edamame, um, so there are vines, uh, there are more bushy bean plants that have tendrils that can grasp onto things that are somewhat vine-like and somewhat bush-like. Uh, there are also um, smaller flowering plants like clover. Uh, so all sorts of different types of, of plant, all sorts of different types of growth habit. Uh, some of them live in temperate zones, some of them live in uh, tropical areas or subtropical areas. Uh, some of them live in semi-arid or desert type areas. I can't think of anything that lives in like a really cold area that's part of the bean family. Um, but you'll have things like mesquite and acacia that grow in fairly arid places. Um, and, uh, you know, clover, which will grow fairly far north, you know, uh, not in the tundra or anything like that, but uh, in northerly temperate zones. So also, as far as this plant family's um, relationship with humans, some of our big staple crops are members of this family. That would include soybeans, which are you know, one of the biggest commercially grown crops. Um, it would also include alfalfa, which is a commercially grown feed crop, one of the bigger commercially grown feed crops. People don't eat a lot of alfalfa, but uh, livestock gets fed a lot. A lot of alfalfa gets fed to livestock. Um, so it's it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a crop that accounts for a lot of acreage under cultivation in this country and in a lot of other places as well. <clears throat> um, beans, all sorts of beans, including green beans, but also lima beans and fava beans are part of this family. Uh, sweet peas, chickpeas, um, black-eyed peas, lentils, uh, huge, huge, uh, cross-section of staple crops that people eat because uh, 
a lot of the members of this family produce a seed that's capable of drying out completely, being stored more or less indefinitely, and then cooked and eaten. So it's one of the first things and one of the most foundational things that people learned to store as a staple crop. Um, so just, just about, uh, all, well, I won't say just about all, but a lot of different human cultures have various different versions of uh, soup beans or uh, lentil pottage or something like that that's eaten as a hot soup. And a lot of cultures have some kind of mushy thing like hummus or mushy peas uh, that that's, uh, you know, consumed uh, as a sort of a thick crushed variety of something from the bean family. Uh, nutritionally, they provide a lot of protein and a lot of carbs, not a whole lot of fats um, in most of them. They do have some fats in them. <clears throat> soybeans are a commercial source of oil, but there's really not that much oil in an individual soybean. You know, it's just something that can be extracted from them using industrial processes and solvents and things. But uh, that they contain a fairly large amount of nutrients. They'll keep people from starving and uh, you can keep them through the winter. And so they've become um, a really common, or if you don't have winter, maybe through the dry season, uh, if that's what, what you have, which is what you would have in some more arid areas that are desert and maybe not that cold, but uh, subject to, to prolonged periods of dryness. So it's something that you can keep and that will uh, keep you from starving. And so it's become various types of bean seeds have become uh, staple crops throughout the world. Peanuts are another one. Peanuts do have a lot of oil in them. Uh, and they're, uh, you know, a very common food uh, here and also a very common food in a lot of uh, different cuisines and foodways around the world. And there's something that uh, if you have, so there's something you can grow a fairly large amount of on a fairly small amount of ground if you have the right conditions for them. So uh, th those are uh, some examples of the foods that are, are uh, members of this plant family. There are also a lot of medicinal herbs that are members of this plant family. Uh, just to name a few of them, uh, there's licorice and astragalus, both of which I'm going to be talking about later. Um, there are uh, soybeans and red clover, which are both used for their isoflavone content. Uh, Macuna is another uh, plant in the bean family that's that's used medicinally somewhat for for supporting the nervous system. Um, so there there are quite a lot of different ones that are used uh, for different medicinal purposes around the world. Um, but uh, those are uh, soy and clover and licorice and astragalus are four that are very commonly, you know, there's, there's things in the bean family that you would likely be able to go into your local uh, place that sells supplements and find some version of them. Uh, they're, they're all very, um, they're among the top selling herbs, especially soy and red clover are among some of the top selling herbs in the uh, United States herbal market. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's a huge plant family, got a wide variety of, uh, different plant types and a wide variety of different medicinal substances that, that are grown in, in this plant family. Um, besides using them for human consumption as food and medicine or for animal consumption as food and medicine, there are some plants like clover that are grown as a ground cover to enrich the soil because most of these plants 
have the ability to fix nitrogen better than most other plants. They're good at taking nitrogen from the atmosphere, and actually their microbiome helps them to do this, but they can take nitrogen from the atmosphere um, and combine that with uh, carbon dioxide and water and turn it into amino acids. So, you know, I, I mentioned before when we were talking about macronutrients and proteins that humans don't absorb protein and nobody does, not just humans. It's, uh, you know, animals tend not to absorb whole proteins from the food we eat. We break them down into amino acids and absorb them and we recombine those amino acids into the proteins that our bodies need and the proteins that our bodies are made of. So uh, basically, because animals don't fix nitrogen either, all the aminos in the animal protein start out as aminos in plants. And they get changed form into different amino acids uh, in, in different foods as they move through the food chain. But the point where they become aminos is in nitrogen fixation in, uh, in plants, which some plants are really good at and plants of this family uh, are, are especially known for. So the plants themselves can be used to add nitrogen, usable nitrogen to the soil, um, often by planting them uh, letting them start to grow and then plowing them under at the beginning of a growing season. So you might seed the field with them in the fall and have clover or alfalfa or whatever come up early in the spring and then plow that under just to, to enrich the soil. Sometimes people call that a cover crop. Sometimes they call it green manure, um, which I think is kind of a gross term I don't really like. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a way of fertilizing the soil with plants because of their ability to, and their microbiome's ability to, to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, they're basically just using solar energy um, and they're turning air into protein. Um, so that's a pretty neat trick, really. Uh, they're literally making it out of thin air and energy. Uh, so I think that that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing that that's a thing that happens. So they're used as a cover crop. Some of these plants in this family are, and there are also some of them that are considered weeds or, um, invasive species, or even just agricultural pests that aren't necessarily invasive species. Dandelions fix nitrogen some, but but they're not uh, as good at it as uh, as plants in this family are. Uh, so, yeah, the uh, there are a lot of weeds that are members of this family. Now, red clover is sometimes thought of as a weed or white clover, mostly because it disrupts the uniformity of lawns. You know, it's not really like out competing other plants necessarily, but. Uh, People don't like to have clover in their lawns sometimes because they want it to be a uniform field of grass or a uniform area of grass. So sometimes people will, you know, try and get rid of them for that, that reason. Red clover and white clover are not really native to this continent. Um, they were brought over here. Uh, well, white clover was brought over here pretty much exclusively as food for honeybees, European honeybees, which are also not native. And uh, red clover was used somewhat for that and somewhat as a medicine uh, and grown for those purposes. But they're very prolific plants. They produce a lot of seeds and they also grow vegetatively. They grow by spreading and, and continuing to come up in new places. Um, so uh, they are pretty successful once they're introduced and they stick around for a long time. Um, So there are also some other plants um, like, for example, astragalus is a big genus of plants in the bean family. 
and uh, because it's fast growing and because it will grow in arid areas, it sometimes grows in places that have been overgrazed by cattle and sometimes it will be the only thing growing in an arid uh, pasture type situation. And if cattle eat it, it can actually make them, uh, I guess, crazy or um, it makes them stagger around and seem like they're uh, perhaps sick or something like that. Sometimes they foam at the mouth, things like that. So it can look like rabies or something like that, but it's it's just that it's just a poisoning from this plant that uh, you know cattle normally would avoid it because it doesn't taste good. But if it's all there is and they're hungry, they'll try to eat it because it doesn't taste that bad. But uh, so there are a few different. Uh, there are many different species of astragalus. Uh, the medicinal one is not really uh, the one I just described, um, but there, but it's, there are some that, that will do that. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it's considered a weed, even though it's a native species. And sometimes, you know, people try to make sure that it's not present in, in places where cattle are grazing. Um, but really the main thing they need to do is make sure that other food is present. Uh, because it tends to be a problem when there are just too many cattle or too many whatever animals, grazing animals, for the amount of rainfall and the amount of space to support. Uh, similarly, locust trees, which are common around here, there, there are um, black locusts and honey locust trees. Um, uh, because they will grow, because they're some of the first trees to grow back in an area, and a lot of the time they grow in disturbed areas, sometimes they're thought of as weeds or weedy type plants because they grow where people are not trying to have them grow. Uh, you know, and this is really more a land use problem than it is any fault of the plant. It's just that, uh, you know, people will put up a uh, maybe they'll put up power lines and cut down all the trees under power lines and locust trees will be some of the first trees that start growing there uh, just because they're able to uh, grow in direct sunlight without a lot of other shade and they grow pretty quickly. Uh, they, at least they grow tall pretty quickly. They, they grow thick kind of more slowly. Um, so if you're going around Lexington and you see um, a stand of trees growing in a ditch or growing in um, a park that's been let to go back to forest after having previously been cleared or something like that, a lot of the time there'll be locust trees or locust trees will be part of it. Also along railroad tracks, things like that, uh, where they periodically get cleared out. Um, but uh, they're uh, some of the uh, first trees that will become big trees in that type of a situation. And like I said, they're very common around here. And uh, that includes Gladitsia, which are the honey locusts and often have gigantic thorns on them. Although there is a thornless species that's grown in parking lots as a, as a shade tree. Uh, and then there is uh, black locusts, which um, are in the genus Pseudoacacia. And uh, So the, those are, uh, they're very hard wood. Most trees in the bean family have very hard wood. Um, and uh, even, even though they're relatively fast growing, the, the wood tends to be pretty hard. So some things like locust, mesquite, um, they're used for maybe furniture and carving and things like that because they have interesting grain to them and they have uh, fairly uh, tough wood. Uh, in the case of locusts, they're also pretty weather resistant. So uh, sometimes they're used structurally or traditionally have been used structurally for things like the pylons under porches uh, or something like that where they might be in contact with the ground because they, they don't rot very quickly, although they do eventually decay.
Another really neat thing about plants in this family is that um, they're able to move in response to external stimuli in, in ways that some other plants are not as able to do. Now, pretty much all plants will turn towards sunlight or towards light or align themselves with gravity. But uh, plants in the bean family, the leaves are also equipped with a knee-like structure that's flexible. Uh, and that flexibility is achieved by the plant moving carbohydrates around and changing the concentration of water to inflate or deflate parts of the joint. And uh, if you've ever uh, seen albizia trees, which sometimes people call mimosa trees, um, that, that are a pretty common landscape tree here, uh, they and some other plants in the bean family actually go to sleep. They close up their leaves at night to conserve water. So they're able to, um, they have a circadian rhythm they're able to uh, respond to the stimulus of nightfall by closing up their leaves. Uh, some some of plants like sensitive plant uh, or mimosa pudica, if you touch them, they'll fold up their leaves in response to touch. Um, so, uh, question is, what was the name of that? Uh, the name of uh, Albizia is the name of the first one that I mentioned, or mimosa tree, and it's got uh, compound leaves, and it's got uh, um, pink fluff-looking flowers, uh, blooms in the summertime around here, attracts hummingbirds, and has a really sweet smell to it. Its Latin name is Albizia. Uh, sometimes people call it mimosa, which is kind of confusing because there's another genus called mimosa that has similar shaped flowers. Um, but uh, albizia is, um, I use the flowers of it. Some people also use the bark of it as a sort of antidepressant or stimulant to the central nervous system. And uh, so it's, it's a medicinal plant as well. And uh, because it produces lots of beans and they get scattered easily, it's, uh, it, it also sometimes shows up on its own as a volunteer, as a weed. Um, it likes to grow up against the foundations of buildings, which is not really a good place, not, not healthy for the building, but uh, you know, it's kind of a, uh, the equivalent of growing up against a crack in a rock, I suppose, for the plant gives it some stability. Is that the one you were saying has its own like circadian rhythm? Yeah, yeah, it does. And uh, and some other plants in the family do as well, uh, have the ability to close up uh, when they, they go to sleep and they close up their leaves. Um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting because they, these plants actually move quick enough that you can sit there and watch them move. You know, it's not uh, uh, not quite the same as um, geotropism where you lay a tomato plant in a pot on its side and later that day it's standing up, right? It's more like, you know, it happens uh, fast enough to see it in real time uh, without having to watch for a really long time. I suppose you could... If you were patient enough, you could see the tomato plant stand itself up too, but it would happen very, very slowly. Um, so yeah, they, they do have the ability to move a little bit. And a lot of plants in this family also have tendrils, which are little uh, string-like projections that can wrap around things. Um, and that's also a form of movement that can happen fairly quickly. So, you know, if you've ever grown uh, pole beans, they'll they'll grow up a, a pole or a trellis or whatever, and they'll wrap these little tendrils around it. Um, lots of pea plants do that as well, snow peas and sugar snap peas, which are both common garden plants and even the sort of thing that you might be getting started indoors and getting ready to plant out. Uh, if you're gardening this year, it's just about time for that. So, um, 
yeah, the, the, a lot of a lot of plants in this family have uh, have tendrils, which are also another form of uh, moving uh, plant structure. Some of the plants have a very distinctive pea flower shape, um, which if you don't know what I mean, you can you can look them up. But uh, you know, pea, pea plants have a particular flower shape. Most of the plants in this family have some variation of that shape, like a, a cluster of them or one big one or, you know, a small uh, grouping of them or something like that. A few plants have a modified version that doesn't really look like that unless you look very closely. And the albizia would be an example of that and the acacia would too. They have uh, something that looks like, or the mimosa as well, uh, something that looks more like a ball of fluff uh, that is actually a cluster of flowers. If you look at a red clover or, or any kind of clover, not any kind of clover, red clover, white clover, crimson clover. They all have an inflorescence, a flower head that is made up of a bunch of tiny pea flowers. So that's often what the flower looks like. And then the seed, generally speaking, is some kind of bean pod. In some cases, it only has one bean, one seed in it. But a lot of the time, it will be like a bean with multiple seeds inside of it uh, that looks a lot like uh, a dried bush bean. Um, if you've ever grown, you know, soybeans or even a green bean uh, looks is basically along the same lines. But a lot of the plants have basically a bean as its fruit. So um, red bud trees, mimosa trees, uh, senna, that's a plant that we saw on one of our herb walks. It has uh, long skinny pods, but they're essentially beans as well. Uh, it's a member of the same family. All right, so uh, medicinally speaking, there are a bunch of different substances that are produced by, um, by plants in this family because it's a huge plant family and they all contain a bunch of different things. But one of the most researched categories of plants in this plant family are what are called isoflavones. And uh, isoflavones are, um, well, they're, they're uh, organic compounds that have multiple sort of rings of carbon atoms together. And, uh, they have a particular type of structure to them, but uh, they're um, here. Let me see if I can find an example. Um, something that I did recently. I want to find this and then share content with you from uh, to kind of give you an idea of what they look like. Okay, so can everybody see that? This is sort of a schematic of what isoflavones look like, generally speaking. Uh, so you can see that you've got two little hexagons and then that are connected to each other, that share a side essentially. And then you've got a third hexagon that is not sharing a side with them, but is connected to them. So those hexagons are rings of six carbon atoms and they have oxygens and hydrogens attached to them. Um, but that's just kind of the general shape of what an isoflavone looks like. Um, these are two widely researched isoflavones called genistein and diazine. 
and they are both present in soybeans. And so I've, I've drawn them to kind of look like the pods of, or the, the beans in a pod, uh, as they're the, uh, um, carbon rings were, were beans in a pod. So just as kind of a way of remembering what this type of molecule looks like structurally. Uh, so these are close enough in appearance, close enough in shape that uh, they sort of can um, mimic what estrogen is doing in the body. They, they kind of act like weak estrogens in the human body. No, no, hang on a second. Uh, oh, here we go. All right, yeah. So that they sort of act like weak estrogens in the body. They bind to estrogen receptors, which are proteins or collections of proteins on the surfaces of cells that estrogen molecules would normally attach to and change how that cell is functioning. And uh, these isoflavones can attach to those same uh, clumps of proteins, basically, and create a similar change in how the cell is functioning, but weaker, weaker than what normal human estrogens would do. So in a human body, there are multiple different types of estrogens, and there are multiple different strength levels of those estrogens. And uh, genistein or other isoflavones are weaker than all of them, um, but they're stronger than nothing. So this creates an interesting situation where an isoflavone attaching itself to one of these receptor sites can either increase the total estrogenic activity because it's stronger than nothing and nothing might have been what was connecting to that receptor site before, or if there was plenty of estrogen or even too much estrogen, it can get in the way of the more powerful estrogens and result in a decrease in total estrogenic activity. So in a person who had very low estrogen, it would tend to increase the estrogenic activity. And in a person with very high estrogen, it would tend to decrease the total estrogen activity. And so we sometimes talk about this as balancing hormones, but that's sort of a misnomer. It's not really balancing them. Uh, a more accurate way to describe it is to say that it has a partial agonist antagonist relationship with the estrogens, with the estrogen receptors. So it might be agonizing it, in, in other words, making it function more, or it might be antagonizing it, in other words, working against it. Um, and, it, you know, it, it can do both depending on what the situation is uh, with uh, what, what the levels of circulating estrogens are like in the person's body. Does that all make sense? I, I feel like that's kind of a complicated concept that I'm trying to, uh, to explain. So let me know if that makes sense or if you have any questions about that. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so if someone doesn't have any natural estrogen, well, I guess you're going to always have a little bit of estrogen kind of in your body. But mm. say like a woman has zero of her um, sexual organs. So like yeah. nothing that produces estrogen. Would these isoflavones then produce more for her? They would act like estrogen for her. So they would, it would pretend it would be to be the those, estrogen. They would pretend to be the estrogen. They would fill in for the estrogen, literally okay. filling in the actual gaps that the estrogen would go in. Now, in a person who's had their sexual organs removed, there's still going to be multiple sources of estrogen production in the body, specifically the thyroid gland, if present, uh, the adrenal glands, which pretty much everybody still has their adrenal glands, um, and uh, body fat. All of those are places where estrogen is produced. It can also be produced in the liver, but it isn't usually very much. 
So all of those are places in a person's body besides their reproductive system that that estrogen is going to get produced. So there would still be likely to be some, but a lot of the time, you know, it's low and there are certain clinical um, patterns that we see when it is low, like hot flashes and night sweats and things like that, that are, that are pretty familiar. Um, often, especially when it is getting lower and before it's stabilized. And then long-term, of course, you get uh, brittleness of bones can be, a, can be a result of it being low for a long time. But that doesn't change quickly. You can't always feel it when it's happening. But uh, so in a person like that, yes, this would increase. Um, it wouldn't make them make more estrogen. And it wouldn't really show up as estrogen on a, on a metabolic panel or whatever, but it will fill in for the estrogen. Um, so it will kind of do what the estrogen would be doing if it were there. So yeah. So it would kind of help prevent, you know, some of those things that come with low estrogen, just it just as a substitute teacher or what have you. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. What about in someone who's like very young and I mean, would it still kind of act the same way? Like, I'm fascinated by this, as you can tell, apologies for the long questions. No, it's, it's fine. Um, in somebody who's very young, uh, I mean, it depends on what the situation was with their estrogen in their body, you know, whether they had a lot of it or not. Um, but uh, it, it can if somebody takes large amounts of these, if somebody takes a small amount, they might not notice much difference. Some people, when they take small amounts of red clover or like, you know, fairly normal amounts of red clover, they might just feel more energetic. Some people would feel more uh, libido. Uh, some people feel more appetite, although that's not a very common thing, but it can happen as a result of the same thing. Um, I have seen somebody who is drinking a liter of, uh, red clover tea every day, which is like really a lot. And uh, they, they started lactating without ever having been pregnant. Uh, and so that was, you know, an unusual outcome. Uh, I haven't seen that often enough to know whether that would happen every time or what, but uh, you know, it would take a lot of, drink, take a lot of uh, uh, which, you know, I mean, lactation is not specifically an estrogen. That's not a direct effect of estrogen. There, there have to be multiple, uh, multiple different, uh, some, some kind of chain reaction that gets from too much of the stuff in the red clover to changing what the estrogen is doing and that changing what the prolactin is doing and that re leading to production of lactation. So anyway, you know, that's, if I wanted somebody to be able to lactate, that's not the first thing I would reach for. Um, because there are much more reliable things, but that is, you know, a, a weird consequence that can occur from taking uh, a sort of injudicious amount of, of red clover. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's much weaker than human estrogen and structurally it's not human estrogen or it's not really, it's not, it doesn't have the structure of an estrogen. Uh, but it, but it's you know close enough that it will fit into those receptor sites and and activate them. So is it fair to say that including um, something in this family like red clover into a woman's daily regimen of teas or what have you would be a healthy habit, or could that have some adverse issues? Uh, usually that's a, a safe and healthy thing to do. You know, it's, uh, of course, dose can make a poison of anything, but, uh, or a problem of right. anything, but, uh, you know, in, in the normal sorts of doses that people might consume, uh, like, you know, four ounces of tea a day instead of a liter of tea a day or, uh, something like that, it's, it's pretty much safe and helpful. Excellent. And, you know, it's, it's not a dramatically powerful medicine. It is a food-like medicine. You know, you're getting some of these isoflavones anytime you eat beans, uh, anytime you eat, uh, you know, soup beans or edamame or anything like that. Um, 
small amounts. Uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't usually produce a clinically significant result in the, in the amounts that are available in those things. Although if you sprout them, then sometimes it will because they're, the actual isoflavone content of sprouts is quite a bit higher than it is in uh, mature plants. So, uh, you know, red clover sprouts are actually a stronger source of isoflavones than, uh, than uh, just red clover, which contains a wider variety of isoflavones than soy, but a similar amount. Um, and then there are some things like mung beans, or uh, there's a thing called scurf peas that are not very common around here, but uh, uh, but you can find them if you look for them, uh, that are uh, um, quite a bit higher in, uh, in their uh, isoflavone or otherwise known as phytoestrogen content um, than, than uh, clover and soybeans are. Thank you very much. Sorry for yeah. being so disruptive. No, no problem. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, yeah, so that's one of the main categories of substances that are in a lot of, uh, of these plants that make them medicinal. That's not the only thing, but uh, but it is one of the main one of the main things. Um, some of them also contain what are called saponins, which are uh, kind of maybe a little bit bigger version of the same type of molecule with uh, an extra hexagon added to it, and then maybe some sugar molecules attached to it. Uh, to make one big molecule. And there are a lot of those in various different plants, but there are several uh, plants in the uh, bean family that do contain that type of structure of molecule. And those tend to have an effect on the endocrine system in some form or another. And exactly what that effect is depends on, on the different uh, substances. But there, there are a lot of them, and, and a lot of them have some different endocrine modulating effects. And like I said, there are also things um, that uh, influence other systems in the body uh, in, in these uh, plants as well. And um, many of them also contain uh, oligosaccharides, basically medium length chains of uh, of sugar molecules made into a starch. So they're not quite like regular starches and they're not quite sugars either. They're kind of barely complex carbohydrates or low complexity carbohydrates. And these tend to be things that our bodies don't really use very much, but that our microbiota do use. So, if you eat a bunch of beans, um, then these get into your digestive system. The bacteria thrive off of them. They produce a lot of gas. And that's why, you know, beans give people gas. But it also is useful for reestablishing gut flora after somebody's been sick. Um, and a lot of them also contain fiber, both soluble and insoluble fiber, which can help with... Uh, um, the same type of thing, help with uh, bowel function, uh, help with uh, reestablishing gut flora and uh, keeping, uh, keeping stools from being too hard or too soft. And uh, so there are, there are a lot of uh, um, nutritional uh, benefits to, to eating uh them as as uh as food but then there's also in smaller amounts sometimes more specialized versions of the same thing uh that that help with um uh, that, that are more medicinal so for example with senna it's not really it's actually containing some uh some something more like the saponin type molecules that uh that gets metabolized by your gut bacteria and then turned into something that 
strongly stimulates the lining of your gut and has a laxative effect. So these are called senicides. They are they're saponins, they're saponicides. So they're like they're variations of the same molecular theme as what the isoflavones are and what the uh, the uh, saponins that affect the endocrine system are, but they're not absorbed into the system. They stay in the gut. And uh, once they get broken down by the gut bacteria or metabolized by the gut bacteria, they transform into something that stimulates or irritates the lining of the gut and has this laxative effect. And there are several uh, plants besides just senna that contain uh, similar stuff in, in the same bean family. So uh, that's something to, uh, you know, this... I think it's kind of interesting to be aware of the fact that it's like all the same, um, the same processes or the same uh, kind of general shape of molecule that the plant is elaborating that has these different effects in different forms. Um, one of which is to be a stimulant laxative and one of which is to um, act as a substitute estrogen and one of which is able to uh, or another category of which is able to uh, have different effects on the endocrine system, which we will talk about some more in, in, a, in a minute here when I get into the specifics of licorice and what it does and how it works. <clears throat> but before I talk about licorice, I want to talk about astragalus. Astragalus, by astragalus, I mean, astragalus membranaceus, which is um, a medicinal and widely used medicinal species of astragalus. There are other um, types of astragalus that are called loco weed or pea vine that are, uh, you know, more of a bitter plant that, that's a menace to cattle grazing. But, uh, oh, yes, yeah, spelling of astragalus. Let me write that down in the chat. Astragalus. So the root of astragalus is the part that's used medicinally. And the flavor of it is both sweet and bitter. And uh, so it contains some starches, uh, some, some sugar molecules that are kind of bound to other molecules uh, and then it contains some acids and alkaloids and it, when it's fresh it's got sort of a milky sap so I guess kind of some latex type stuff but uh, typically it's sliced thin um, into long thin strips and dried and uh, it's uh, mostly used for uh, as, as an immune boosting herb. So astragalus is used in a lot of Chinese formulas. It's also used on its own sometimes. Uh, and it pretty strongly stimulates and motivates the cells of the immune system to have a response. It's not something you would usually want to use in a person who is uh, uh, who's experiencing autoimmunity, but it is something that uh, can be really helpful in... Uh, helping someone to get over a sickness that their body's trying to fight off, or sometimes maybe even helping them to avoid a sickness that's going around. Uh, I use it more than most other immune herbs for people who are already sick and who are trying to uh, rally their immune system to get over something that's already gotten a hold of them. And uh, in, in my personal experience, it seems to, uh, to shine pretty well in that role. Um, and it's, it's kind of, I don't exactly know what's going on on a molecular level with, with that process. Uh, but uh, I know that some of the substances that are believed to be responsible are also saponicides uh, and that, uh, that they're, you know, kind of like the same, uh, a bigger version of the same um, multiple ring uh, nucleus 
that uh, that that I described for the isoflavones, uh, and so uh, you know it it does seem to uh, stimulate the appetite a little bit. It seems to decrease how much people are feeling the inflammatory symptoms of of an illness, and it seems to stimulate uh, the presence of white cells and lymphocytes, uh, macrophages and lymphocytes, in a way that helps people to get over sicknesses faster. Say that so last part the, again. I'm sorry you broke up on my end. Oh, uh, yeah. So it, uh, it helps to stimulate uh, the body's production of, or at least the availability in the bloodstream of uh, macrophages and lymphocytes, white blood cells that are, that are helping people to get over uh, illnesses. Which like, if you give echinacea to somebody who's already sick, sometimes it doesn't make that much difference. But astragalus seems to do better than echinacea in that role as like uh, something to boost the immune system of someone who's already feeling sick. Uh, and I'm basing that on personal experience and on what I have seen under the microscope, looking at the blood cells of people in those situations with those herbs. Although I, I don't have any like uh, specific published studies that uh, that I have seen that necessarily look into that. Uh, but but that's that's how it appears to be uh, from from my experience. And uh, astragalus, the stuff that's in astragalus is pretty much water soluble. So it does work well as a tea. Uh, it's also traditionally cooked in soup uh, for sick people, but some people find it hard to take because it is bitter. And uh, most people in our culture aren't really accustomed to bitter foods very much. Um, so, you know, people might, uh, might shy away from it or it might be hard to get people to, uh, to adhere to a program of, of uh, consuming astragalus chicken soup. But, uh, but it is something that has been done and that, that does seem to have a, a pretty positive effect or be a pretty positive way to use the herb if the person's not too put off by the taste of it. But a simple tea works too. Uh, you want to uh, make a very light decoction of it. You don't want to cook it for a long time or anything, but bring it to a simmer for a minute or so, and then let it steep for a while uh, and agitate it, maybe pound on it a little bit while it's in the hot water to get all the good stuff out of the roots. Just a moment, I'll be right back. Oh, right. we make, when making a tea with the astragalus, is there anything specifically that you would blend it with to make it a little bit more palatable for someone who is sick and might be sensitive or have like an upset stomach, but still needs to take it kind of a thing? Ginger. I find ginger goes pretty well with it as far as that goes, because this, the taste of the ginger um, doesn't clash with it really hard. Uh, but uh, but is strong enough to kind of mask it somewhat, and you know is 
fairly complementary in terms of what it does because ginger will reduce nausea and induce sweating, which kind of helps relieve the symptoms of fever sometimes. So, you know, I feel like uh, it's a pretty good combination. So the other specific herb that I wanted to talk about, which is also a member of Fabaceae, is uh, licorice. And licorice is one of these medicinal herbs, along with peppermint and marshmallow, for instance, that its name is pretty universally known as uh, the name of a type of candy. Uh, but a lot of people in our culture are not really familiar with the plant itself or, you know, they don't realize that the flavor licorice actually comes originally from somewhere instead of just being a flavor that someone dreamed up someday. Uh, so originally it was really widely used as a medicine and uh, people started making candies as a medicinal preparation from it. And then they started, you know, making artificially flavored candies that kind of tasted like it. Licorice root is really sweet. And it also contains, uh, in addition to the strong sweetness, uh, kind of a weird licorice taste. Um, and what's responsible for both the sweetness and the licorice flavor, mainly, is a substance called glycerin. And glycerin is also a saponin. Uh, you know, it, it has uh, basically three of those hexagons and then that are attached, that are that share sides with each other, and then one that doesn't. And then it has two sugar molecules attached to it. Uh, and that's what the molecule looks like. So it looks like a little bean with uh, four pods in it, or a little pod with four beans in it, and then two sugar molecules attached to that. Uh, just to, to visualize it in keeping with how, how I had drawn the, uh, the soybean phytochemicals. So it has a very intensely sweet flavor to it, sweeter than sugar, uh, kind of too sweet for a lot of people's liking. Um, but that, uh, that substance does a lot of different things. And uh, there are two kind of two different, I think of them as two different levels of usage, a sort of immediate, uh, very short-term use, and then a sort of short to medium-term use, uh, which are both possible for, for this particular herb. Uh, and that both, both, well, hmm. well, I'll get into that part in a second. So the really short to medium-term use of licorice is for stomach issues. It's pretty safe and effective for upset stomach, um, for indigestion, reflux, uh, things like that. It does kill a bacteria called Heliobacter pylori that is responsible for most cases of ulcers. So it can be helpful in that type of situation. If people have reflux, uh, because their body is not producing enough digestive enzymes, and so the stomach is churning harder, uh, or enough digestive substances, so that the stomach is churning harder to try and uh, make things digest. Licorice will actually help to soothe that, because it's actually going to stimulate the production of more digestive juices and uh, make it so the digestion is happening more smoothly. So kind of the opposite of what antacids do, Instead of being an antacid, it's more like almost like a pro acid, but uh, but it but it will help with heartburn, um, and it will help with it maybe in a more lasting way than an antacid would, which is just kind of weakening the stomach juices to the point where you don't feel their effects as the stomach is churning, uh, and as some of them might get uh, refluxed out of the stomach and into the uh, esophagus. So it's helping to promote di digestion, helping with the absorption of nutrients, and in so doing, helping with symptoms in the stomach. And that 
is one of the big uses of licorice. It also helps with coughs uh, some of the time. Um, it's not necessarily uh, cough suppressant exactly. It's just kind of soothing. Um, so it, it sometimes will help with coughs. Uh, so all of that is very short-term use, you know, acute situations, something where you might be in immediate discomfort and get some immediate relief from the use of licorice. The other thing about licorice is, that's kind of useful or useful and or dangerous, uh, depending on the scenario, uh, when using it on a longer term basis is the way that it affects the kidneys. Now, the glycerism that I mentioned, it's possible to get licorice that has had that taken out of it. And it's still somewhat good for stomach issues. It's not as good, but it's still somewhat good. The reason that they take it out some of the time is because when licorice has the glycerism in it, it changes the way that the body handles electrolytes. It changes the way that the kidneys handle electrolytes. And specifically, it makes the kidneys spill potassium and retain sodium. And so uh, that's something that can be a problem. It can lead to higher blood pressure in people who have high blood pressure that's sensitive to sodium. Uh, so that's something to be aware of uh, if you're if you're recommending licorice to somebody, uh, if you're giving somebody licorice for something for their stomach. Uh, at the same time, this action is the basis of a lot of licorice's use in Chinese medicine. And uh, you know, there are a couple different species of, of licorice, but they all, what I'm saying applies pretty well to, to all the ones that contain the licorice flavor, uh, which is the substance glycerism. So um, in Chinese medicine, licorice is mostly used uh, for what might be described as hormonal support. And the way that it accomplishes this it's kind of kind of roundabout, but uh, it makes a person uh, lose potassium, and then the endocrine system responds by producing hormones that help to retain potassium and spill sodium, and this kind of creates um, an overall effect where a person has more aldosterone in their body and. Uh, downstream from that, maybe more testosterone, more libido, uh, maybe more potential of facial hair and body hair growth, uh, which is not usually a, a clinical issue, but uh, more energy and uh, just kind of a stronger sense of vitality. Uh, so, so it can actually do all of that. And it's doing all of that by affecting the sodium and potassium balance, which affects renin and angiotensin and aldosterone, uh, which are some of the main regulatory mechanisms of the, uh, of the endocrine system and of the body as a whole. So it's, uh, it, that, that's something that it can be used for, for when it's being used for a period of weeks rather than a period of hours. Um, or, you know, somebody somebody has heartburn, they might take licorice like once a day. And usually it's the sort of thing where they could do that for a week and then stop. And it would be not something that would recur right away, or maybe at all. Um, so that's, you know, hours to days, it's used for this more short-term process. And in the weeks to a month or so, it can be used for helping to uh, change what's going on with the endocrine system. And in so doing, it's also working on the circulatory system. And you do want to make sure that a person is not getting too much high blood pressure, or getting too much uh, hypertension uh, in their muscles or uh, anything like that. Uh, that's not interfering with their heart. You wouldn't want to do this in somebody whose heart was not in good shape or that was retaining fluid in their extremities or anything like that. 
you would want to address those issues first before before attempting anything like that. So that's uh, you know that's actually the main thing that licorice is used for in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, much more so than it's used for the short term issues. And so I think that that's kind of kind of an interesting uh, effect that it has, or an interesting clinical strategy of uh, regulating the hormones by affecting the electrolytes and uh, affecting the kidneys. In uh, Western medicine, we don't usually think of the kidneys as being uh, part of the endocrine system or of playing a strong role in the endocrine system, but uh, many traditional medicine systems do see them that way. And you know, it, even, even in conventional Western medicine, there's, there is the acknowledgement that if, if the electrolytes get thrown off, then the hormones get thrown off with them and that the kidneys do in fact, you know, play a role that, that at least indirectly affects, uh, affects hormones and metabolism and things like that. So I have a question again. <laughs> um, Go ahead. So with licorice and the glycerazine, I guess I'm saying that correctly. Um, so if you wanted to use it in the short term for someone who was having digestive issues, but they also have kidney issues, is that a gamble to possibly let them temporarily take it in like tea form with a couple of other herbs for a couple of weeks? Is that kind of a not something you would want to do? I, I wouldn't do it for that long of a time. No, I like, I really wouldn't hesitate to do it like as a once off kind of thing, but mm -hmm. if it was going to be on an ongoing basis, I'd probably try and find something else to use. Oh, okay. All right. Great. Yeah. I have yeah, someone so who is severely constipated, like rock hard stomach, but I, mm. I can't, I can't get it to go. And so I was thinking of licorice, but they do have high blood pressure and some kidney stuff. So I hadn't done that yet. Cause I was a little scared mm. too. Yeah. A lot of the time in that situation, if things are like just really rock hard and not moving, one of the simplest things that you can do is an osmotic laxative like molasses that's going to actually draw water into the gut. Um, and sometimes that's going to work a little better than something that's actually metabolized or, you know, is a more uh, complicated form of medicine because it's just going to be kind of allowing the, uh, the stool to have more water in it because sometimes it's not going anywhere unless it does. Uh, so that's often what I would start with in that type of a situation. I might add in something as a stimulant laxative like aloe or senna to, to help things move, especially if, you know, a day or so of uh, drinking water with molasses in it or something like that didn't get things to go. But uh, How much molasses? Just like a spoonful? Like a big spoonful mixed into a glass of water, something like that. Lord. He's liable to just eat it on toast. You can he eat prays. it on toast. He probably weird. You, you, you want to make sure that you're drinking water with it at yes. least. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, if you do mix it in water, you want to mix it in warm water because it won't really mix in cold water very well. Uh, I mean, it will, but it's hard. It's a lot harder to mix, to get it all, to get the whole spoonful to melt into the cold water. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll go much easier in the warm water. Well, great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, molasses is famous for, you know, uh, gaining and losing viscosity depending on what room temperature is, what the ambient temperature is. So with, within, the, uh, within the range of what you might experience in, you know, a very cold room or a very warm room, it, it can be very liquid or very solid. So that's why people talk about molasses in January and it's just, it's, when it's uh, when it's chilly, it flows a lot more slowly. So when you're mixing it in with water, it'll flow off of the spoon and dissolve into the water much more readily if it's uh, you know warm. Anyway, thank you for that. Is yeah, the you're very like welcome. you can get the deglycerized licorice in like tablet form? Are those pretty safe to take like a, on a long term basis? Pretty much, yeah, yeah, they pretty much are. Uh, 
and they're still helpful for stomach stuff. Okay, cool. Yeah. The taste of licorice is disgusting, by the way. I can't stand it. It's yeah, so yeah. a lot of people <laughs> find it really objectionable. You know, uh, people say that, you know, it's like the worst candy flavor in the world or whatever. But uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it tastes too sweet, <laughs> but yeah, not so exactly. bad. Yeah, um, exactly. I think the stevia is worse and like kind Agreed. of similar to my palate. Uh, it's like a more intense, sickly sweet uh, the, than what licorice is. Yeah, I don't like anything sweet anyway. I don't even like, like, I don't even eat sugar at all. So anything that yeah. has the slightest sweetness to it, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I made my is, husband uh, drink licorice when he had COVID recently for his cough and stuff, and he actually hated it, but he drank it because he did say it did help. So, you know, it does. Good. It does work. It does work. It does work. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, and it can it can be very helpful medicine in the right situation, even though a lot of people don't really like the taste of it. I find that I like the taste of it. Or that I, I, I disliked the taste a lot more when I was younger than I do now. Now it's, it's I don't know if it's kind of like an acquired taste, and I finally acquired it sometime in my early forties or whatever. But uh, I, I don't find it so bad now. There was a time when I just couldn't abide it at all. But uh, yeah, so it's like anyway. knowing why it tastes that way, like the reason for it, and that that taste is actually providing something useful and helpful I find that I can tolerate things a little bit better just knowing why they taste the way they do I'm like right. okay I hate the way this tastes but I know why it's tasting that way and then it's gonna help me <laughs> right yeah another neat thing about licorice is that it is somewhat uh helpful with mental clarity so I, I sometimes have been using licorice and I, I assume that this is part of its endocrine system effects as well, because the endocrine system has a lot of a lot of uh, play in this arena. But I think that it has a lot to do. Uh, I mean, I think that it has a, a pretty noticeable effect on uh, on mental clarity. And uh, in the case of post-COVID mental clarity, I've especially been using it because. Um, the same system that I mentioned earlier, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system that has to do with uh, electrolytes and hormones and kind of the interface between electrolytes and hormones, that gets thrown off really badly by COVID. And I think that that's responsible for a lot of the long-term effects that people see uh, after COVID. And so since since 2020, I've been using licorice pretty often for uh, for people with uh, COVID after effects, and uh, I don't know if anybody saw it, but last April I did a four part webinar series on on long COVID for the American Herbalists Guild, and next Monday I'm doing uh, one of the four parts of another four part series uh, on the same topic. So. Um, licorice is pretty central to my strategy for uh, for long COVID. And, you know, it's different with everybody what symptoms are showing up and therefore what structures and functions need to be supported. But I'm often using licorice to try and nudge the nervous system and endocrine system back uh, the opposite direction from the direction that they get nudged by, uh, by COVID. The COVID, the virion, the COVID virus, binds to um, uh, ACE2, which is angiotensin converting enzyme uh, protein on the surface of cells. That's how it attaches to and enters the cells. So it's actually in so doing, it's triggering uh, the actions in cells that the angiotensin would normally influence, angiotensin being, being a hormone in the body. And so, um, it's throwing off that whole regulatory system. 
and licorice helps to kind of regulate it in the other direction. So, so sometimes, uh, pretty often, I'm using licorice to try and help people uh, get over the after effects, including mental clarity, which I also use licorice for mental clarity in people with age-related memory loss, for instance. I don't use it as much in people with uh, memory problems that are a result, are a result of a brain injury, but in age-related memory loss, it seems to be pretty helpful. Um, and uh, so in people with COVID-related brain fog and memory issues, it seems to be even more helpful because I think it's having whatever effect it normally has on the brain function, which is probably something along the lines of making the body make more steroids, which makes the brain consume more glucose or changes how the body is handling energy in general in a way that creates more energy and alertness. Uh, I think that's probably what it's doing in general. But in the case of people with long COVID, it's actually maybe helping to bring the uh, endocrine system and the interface between the endocrine system and uh, the nervous system a little more back into the balance that it should have been in. And so I've seen some results where somebody would come to me after having, for instance, brain fog really bad and fatigue for six months and then doing licorice and sometimes some other herbs, depending on what the, the uh, circumstances are, what their individual clinical picture is, but using that as part of, a, of the process of supporting their body and then having them get back to normal within the span of a month or a couple of weeks after having months of being really out of alignment. So it's uh, that that's an area that uh, that I've been using licorice in the the mental clarity part in general. I've been using it for that since the beginning of my practice. It was one of the um, it was a trick that I learned pretty early on, or something that I, that I heard about from one of my elders in the community I grew up in, and uh, have have kept doing ever since. And then using it for COVID and trying to use it to re-regulate the endocrine system is, of course, you know, something I've only been doing since uh, three years ago, or not even quite three years ago. Actually, yeah, not not quite three years ago. Uh, so you know, a new a new clinical scenario that arose. Um, and it, it's you know been, been pretty helpful for that. So, you know, it's uh, as new stuff comes up, you can kind of base new treatments on uh, on old patterns, on on things that you've seen elsewhere that might be similar. And that's what I what I did in that case and seems to be pretty helpful and continues to seem to be pretty helpful. Just thinking that uh, this week. The 6th of February in 2020 was the first lecture that I gave about COVID. Uh, when it was still an emerging issue and there hadn't been a confirmed case in the U.S. yet, I don't think. And uh, the uh, there was a health and nutrition group that met at the co-op and they had me come and speak to them about, about viruses and about this new one that was coming out. And uh, that, was, that was the beginning of my involvement with COVID and doing community health care during the pandemic. So... Anyway, that's been three years, so that's a pretty significant uh, milestone. And uh, you know, I didn't see the first case of it for a while after that. But uh, but at this point, it's been about three years. It's been close to three years since we started seeing a lot of it, and uh, it's uh, it's it's been quite a process of learning about stuff. But yeah, licorice has been really helpful. It's been been one of the uh, star herbs in uh, in treating people, especially uh, post COVID or long COVID or whatever you want to call it. So um, I had another, oh my gosh, I'm full of questions. I'm so sorry. Um, you no, said fine. that when your elders taught you about licorice, is there like a story behind that? Let's see, the person who told me about it, her name was Hazel Oliver, and she was the sister of my fourth grade teacher. And uh, she knew a lot about plants. And uh, 
I asked her a lot of questions about plants and things like that. And, you know, uh, she, so she she's the person that I first heard about that and many other interesting medicinal properties of plants from. She was uh, very much a mountain woman, but she was also college educated and had traveled some and things like that. So, you know, not necessarily everybody's stereotype of what a mountain woman would be like, but but very much uh, she was very uh, old fashioned in a lot of ways. And uh, yeah, she, she knew a lot about that sort of thing. And so she's one of the people that I, that I learned about. That's, that's about as much of a story as I have about it. But uh, yeah, Thank that's, you for that's sharing. where I, I like your stories. That. Yeah, yeah. And then I first started using it, uh, you know, when I when I first started treating people about 30 years ago, a little, a little more than 30 years ago. Uh, one of the first people, one of the first people that I treated was an older woman who was, you know, ha uh, having some some age related memory changes, not really like Alzheimer's disease, but just, you know, a lot of forgetfulness and difficulty calling up words and things like that. And uh, that was one of the things that I used with her. Licorice and rosemary, still a combination I use fairly often in uh, people in that kind of scenario. Otherwise healthy people in that kind of scenario. Uh, so yeah, good, good, simple, well-tolerated herbs for the most part, uh, even though you know, licorice does have the potential to cause some blood pressure issues. A lot of the time, if you use it for a short period of time and then take a break from it, it's not a problem. And it's not a problem in everybody, even with long-term use. So, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, Licorice and astragalus and the bean family in general. There are, uh, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of medicinal plants. Another medicinal plant in the bean family that I didn't mention, which I'll just go over real quick for just a moment, is uh, kudzu. And uh, we all know that kudzu. Uh, well, maybe not. You may know that kudzu was introduced to the southern United States for erosion control and uh, that it kind of gained a reputation as being very invasive because it grows very fast and will cover an area of ground really fast. Although it does tend to like cover a large area of ground and then just kind of stop. It doesn't seem like it becomes as much of a problem as some other uh, vines like Euonymus here in Lexington, Euonymus vines everywhere, winter creeper, it's just everywhere in fields and things like that. And kudzu doesn't really do that. You know, when I was, uh, I can think of some fields of kudzu in the Red River Gorge area that look about the same now as they did when I first saw them, you know, around 40 years ago. And uh, they're big, they grew over telephone poles and abandoned houses and things like that. But then they just kind of, you know, filled up the space they were gonna fill and stop. So anyway, it has beans uh, and it has flowers, which are edible. And it also has a huge uh, root vegetable, which is very starchy. And the purified starch of that is uh, kudzu starch or kuzu. And uh, it's used as a thickener in some foods. Can also be used medicinally to um, kind of dull the effects of alcohol or make it so that it basically kind of makes people get hungover while they're drinking instead of the next morning. So it can kind of have uh, some limited amount of usefulness in helping people to uh, cease using alcohol. You know, it's, it's not a, a miracle cure for it or anything because people can just not take the kuzu. But uh, if they do take it, then, you know, it's somewhat helpful and it's not as, it's not super intense. It doesn't make people violently ill or anything, but it does make, uh, make that, uh, alcohol experience an unpleasant, mildly unpleasant one and help to create an aversion. As a, an excipient in medicine making, it can also be really good for making, uh, if you're trying to make a liquid into a solid thing, like if you wanted to, 
you could have some kuzu powder and add quite a bit of tincture to it and then let it dry out and get this powder form of uh you know where it would uh, the starch would soak up the liquid and then the as it dried out you would end up with just sort of like a a powdered uh extract so that's that's a something that can be done and at a certain stage where it's getting dry it could be rolled into uh into small tablets so that's uh one one way of making uh making tablets and a little bit of kuzu starch will absorb a whole lot of uh tincture or any other liquid and then it will dry back down to its original size so it's pretty neat in that way just for its uh for its physical properties so i got a question here that says for astragalus how do you determine if someone is too sick to offer it um i give astragalus to people who are kind of mildly to moderately sick if they're you know not too sick to take liquids by mouth um then they're probably okay to take astragalus uh it, it seems to uh you know generally be helpful it might not fix everything but it's not like something you would necessarily need to avoid also for a licorice if it doesn't help or even worsens things post covid what could be happening uh what is probably happening if it doesn't help or even worsens things is that the um it's possible that COVID put things out of order and then the body over responded to that and put things out of order in the other direction. And in that case, licorice is not going to bring it back to baseline, but other adaptogens might, uh, something like, uh, something like ginseng might, or something, um, like reishi mushroom which is going to be milder and more food-like than ginseng might also help to uh, get the body to re-regulate itself um, in a way that, uh, you know, if, if it's not, if it's not, uh, if the licorice is not fixing it, or especially if it's making it worse, it's probably a matter of the body having over-responded to the initial dysregulation. Uh, and kind of already done what the licorice would do plus some uh and then you know maybe they're needing to be decreasing inflammation which in any case with long covid you've always got to work on inflammation because it's always there and it's always a big part of the process it's always a big part of the problem so you know once you've gotten the inflammation down then you might be able to see you know what's out of balance and try and bring that back into balance with other adaptogenic herbs or other uh, nutritive things as well. And this next question is, for a kuzu power, powdered tincture, does the alcohol evaporate? Yes, it will dry out completely. You, you let it dry out completely, the alcohol is gone and the water is gone too. Um, so, you know, if you, uh, if it's still doughy, there could still be some alcohol in it, but at the point where it's like dry um, and weighs something similar to what the kuzu originally weighed, then, you know, there's not going to be any alcohol left because it's completely volatile and there is no dry alcohol. So, yeah, it, it would be safe for alcoholics and just, yeah, not contain any alcohol once it's all the way dry. All right. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So next time I am going to be talking about brassicacea, otherwise known as crucifery, which is the mustard family, and it is uh, another really big family of medicinal plants, or a big family of plants that includes a lot of foods and a lot of medicines. And uh, with each of these plant families, I would encourage you to just uh, go and look them up on Wikipedia and maybe look at some pictures of different plants that are in these families and kind of, you, you'll get to where you can recognize certain things as being members of say the bean family. With the bean family, it's like, okay, does it have seeds that are beans? Does it have 
that particular shape of flower. And you can kind of recognize these things. And that's really what I want is for you to be able to uh, see these things enough times in your own lives that you get to where you can recognize them. And that takes some experience, but uh, you know, being able to search for images is a really helpful thing in gaining that kind of experience because it's uh, you know, something that wouldn't have always been easy to do, but, but now it's very easy to do. And you can look at uh, a licorice flower and um, a black locust flower and you can kind of see how they're similar. Um, and you can look at uh, the flowers of something like redbud or clitoria, which is butterfly pea, and see how they're similar and how they're different from, and also similar to the licorice and the uh, black locust flowers. So I, I would encourage everybody to do that. Uh, for those of you who are still working on plant collections, uh, if your environment is anything like it is here, there are starting to be some plants coming up. Nothing's really blooming. Nothing much is really blooming yet. Henbit and uh, dead nettle are occasionally. But uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to start to see things starting to bloom again, uh, including, well, well, we'll see some things starting to bloom again. Um, uh, yeah, over the next two weeks to a month that, that, that process will start, which, you know, won't, won't be that noticeable unless you're outside looking for it. Although actually crocuses are blooming now in Lexington. Um, so, you know, there are some things that are blooming already, but not, not much as far as wild plants go. But, uh, yeah, you know, keep an eye out for all of that sort of thing even if you're not still working on your plant collection, keep an eye out for what the natural world is doing. And, uh, um, you know, I don't know if uh, you've probably seen, some of you have probably seen it on Instagram where I've been kind of looking at conifers and kind of pointing out the different ways to recognize different conifers from each other since they're, since they're green all year. Um, but yeah, you know, keep, keep uh, Keep looking at what's going on in the natural world around you and familiarizing yourself with that because that uh, that direct connection between you and nature is uh, going to have a lot to do with how good of an herbalist you are and uh, you know how, how in tune you are with the plants and what they uh, have to offer and what you can do with them. All right, um, so any any other questions for today? Well, thank you all so much for coming, and uh, I will see I have you a again soon. Again. Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. Go ahead. Are you gonna offer hedge school year two? I'm thinking about that. Uh, if you've taken year one and you're interested, let me know. I I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, interested. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to offer, and we'll probably be putting out some information soon about some just specific classes that I'm going to be doing here. Like, uh, for example, uh, one, of, one of them is going to be about skullcap and adaptogen, uh, adaptogenic herbs and skullcap. And Aoife is going to do that one. I'm going to do one about uh, herbal remedies for kids. Uh, and there will probably be some, there will definitely be some other ones too. I haven't decided on all the topics yet, but I'm going to do a series of of those here uh, over the next couple of months, and uh, kind of try to get people into the new clinic and show them around. And then in March, I'm going to be doing an open house. So awesome! Well, I yeah. would be in. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Um, yeah, I'm, it's definitely something I'm, I'm thinking about. You have a lot to offer and I always enjoy class, so I very much appreciate you. Thanks, thanks, I really appreciate it. Ditto. All right, yay, glad to hear it. Well, uh, I will talk to you all next week and thanks for coming. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night.